Who in their right mind would consent to leave this planet and go live on that frozen rock? I mean, it's crazy. I'm going to tell you a little bit today about my motivation for doing this, but a lot about what this process, both in applying to be a person who might leave the planet and in studying the planets themselves, has done for my appreciation of the one that we're sitting on right now. In 1868, in Adrianople, Baha'u'llah wrote, Know thou that every fixed star hath its own planets, and every planet its own creatures, whose number no man can compute. This statement was corroborated by scientific discovery a hundred years after Baha'u'llah's ascension in 1892. In 1992 was the first confirmed extrasolar planet, a planet orbiting a star different than our own. This is a revolutionary idea and discovery that's happened in our lifetimes. Today, there are over 3,000 planets that have been discovered around other stars. We are on the cusp not just of a revolution in space exploration, but in a revolution of our understanding of the universe and our place in it. This is a sampling of what humanity has done so far in the solar system. These are active space probes. These are robots that we have built to explore the solar system in which we live. Right now, the Cassini spacecraft is orbiting Saturn inside its rings and in September of this year, will plunge into the upper atmosphere of Saturn to end its life without contaminating the moons of Saturn. Right now, the Juno spacecraft is orbiting Jupiter, sending back images and data that are revolutionizing our understanding of that planet. This is Venus underneath the clouds. Venus suffered from a runaway greenhouse effect early on in the solar system's history. The Earth did not suffer the same fate, partly because it's further from the sun and partly because of the giant impact that created the moon and gave us our tilt, giving us seasons and higher tides than the sun would by itself. When we think about where humans might go, where so far only robots have tread, the two obvious neighbors are Venus and Mars. Mercury is further away, closer to the sun, no atmosphere. The gas giants take years to reach, have no surface you can stand on, and even if you want to go land on their moons, you'll be dead in a day from the radiation around Jupiter. You don't want to go to Venus. <laughs> it's as close to hell as we have in our solar system without being on the surface of the sun. The space probes that Russia has sent to the surface of Venus lasted a matter of seconds. They sent a few pictures back before they succumbed to the intense heat and pressure, but the heat there is over 700 degrees Fahrenheit, so it's definitely not some place that I would like to visit. <laughs> this, however, is a place that I would consider going. In fact, it's a place that I have thought about since I was 13, when I learned that it was a long-term goal for NASA. I'm now an aerospace engineer. I've spent the better part of my professional career preparing for such an eventuality, but it's rarer than winning the lottery to be able to go to space. Less than 600 people in the history of humanity have done it. So what do we want to talk about when we talk about Mars? It's got about one hundredth the atmosphere that we have on Earth. It doesn't have any of the things that we enjoy, that provide the foundation for everything that we call civilization. On Earth, we have a water cycle, a nitrogen cycle, a soil cycle, a carbon cycle. This is a self-contained entity, constantly recycling all of the things that you and I rely upon for every breath that we take and every drink, every morsel of food. We have regolith on other planets, broken rocks on the surface, dust. But there is no other planet in our solar system that has soil. Living regolith, full of microbes, gardened by plants, created over millennia, 
to support not only the plants that provide a portion of the oxygen that we breathe, but also all of the food that we need to survive. When I think about soil, I think about phrases like dirt cheap. We really have no appreciation for this magical substance. We can get precious metals, we can get water, we can get any number of minerals from the asteroid belt and from other planets, but this is the only soil within at least four light years. Voyager 1 spacecraft, currently headed out of the solar system, is going about 11 miles a second. If it were pointed to the nearest star, and the nearest star happened to have an Earth, it'd take about 74,000 years to get there. So, we can't rely on things like terraforming Mars, which we don't have the knowledge to do. We can't rely upon thinking that we'll go to another Earth around another star, because we can't even do that with robots yet. This is the planet that we have to focus on. This is the International Space Station. Arguably the most expensive single object that humanity has ever cooperated to create. It costs about $150 billion. It's been in operation for around 17 years as an orbiting outpost for microgravity and human spaceflight research. When your job is to keep humans alive off of the planet, you quickly realize just how much the Earth does for us. Not just in terms of free oxygen in the atmosphere, food and water, which we produce on Earth and constantly ship to the International Space Station, but the gravity that we take for granted that keeps our muscles and bones strong, keeps our vision good from not putting too much pressure on the back of our retinas, the pressure that we experience at the bottom of this ocean of air that helps hold us together. About 221 people have lived on the International Space Station in the last 17 years. If you look at the cost of what it, it takes to keep them alive, it's about $40 million a year. But there are 7.5 billion of us on the planet. If we wanted to keep humanity alive with the technology that we've developed for the International Space Station, forget the fact that it's resupplied by the Earth. It costs about $300 quadrillion. The global economy is about $100 trillion. So from a back-of-the-envelope calculation, the Earth gives us about 3,000 times more than we can give ourselves with our entire economy. That's for the people who are alive today. We know that the Earth can support a larger population. I'd like to give you a taste of what astronauts call the overview effect. This is what happens to you when you are physically in a spacecraft that's keeping you alive outside of the Earth, and you get to see the Earth as one object hanging in the black void of space. This image is called Earthrise. There are people who argue that this was one of the catalyzing images for the environmental movement. This was taken during Apollo 8, the first time we sent humans around the backside of the moon to test out the spacecraft for the Apollo missions. Astronauts saw this and were overwhelmed. If you were on the moon and not using a zoom camera, a wide angle, say you wanted to take a selfie. <laughs> this is Apollo 17. In that photo is Jack Schmidt, the last person to go to the moon for the first time. Only 12 people have ever set foot on the moon. I can't imagine what it would feel like to stand on the surface of that airless body with a black sky in the daytime and be able to put my thumb up into the sky and obscure the only home that I've ever known. What that sense of isolation feels like, but also that sense of awe that it's that tiny speck that's keeping everyone that I know alive. It's that speck that has supported life for over four billion years that without fail has enabled every single animal that came before me so that I can enjoy this split second at the end of its history as a human being. If you were to go to Mars, this would be your view of Earth. That dot. If you sent a message to Earth, on average, it'd take about 20 minutes to get there. Someone would have to watch it. 
send their reply back and you'd wait 20 minutes. Why would I ever consider going that far away? For me, it's best expressed by a quote from Carl Sagan. He says, the sky calls to us. I've heard that call since I was about three. And I have sought out opportunities to try to prepare myself to be a representative of humanity in discovering what it would take to live somewhere else off of what that land provides, to begin to understand what we would need as a species to create a settlement that would provide an insurance policy in case anything catastrophic ever happened to this planet. This image is called The Day the Earth Smiled. This is the first time that humans were notified in advance that their portrait was going to be taken from deep space. Cassini took this photo. You can see not just the rings of Saturn that we're accustomed to, but the wispy outer rings. And the bright dots that you see in this image are not planets from the inner solar system. Those are moons of Saturn. You really have to zoom in to see Earth. And if you have particularly good vision, you can see the tiny little dot of the moon next to Earth there. But we can go further. This is Voyager 1, out past the orbits of Neptune and Pluto, looking back at the sun, taking the shortest possible exposure that it could so it didn't saturate its instruments. And the two inset photos are Venus and Earth. That's Earth. A tiny speck of dust suspended in a sunbeam. Bahala writes in the Epistle to the Son of the Wolf, Every man of discernment, while walking upon the earth, feeleth indeed abashed, inasmuch as he is fully aware that the thing which is the source of his prosperity, his wealth, his might, his exaltation, his advancement and power, is, as ordained by God, the very earth which is trodden beneath the feet of all men. I encourage you to go and study what it is that the earth does for you, whether it's how it provides you with water or oxygen or recycles the carbon or gives you soil for plants to grow food that you need to survive. But above all, I encourage you to be abashed. Thank you.